and I'll start letting people sign in. <laughs> Welcome folks, I'll give everyone a moment to sign in. Please let us know where you're from in the chat, where you're tuning in from today. Feel free to let us know what you're drinking if you're in a place where that is an appropriate time of day or if you're not, no judgment. All right, punctual crowd this morning. I love to see it. Oh, there's all kinds of fun people on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Give good another morning. moment and then I'll get started. Got some locals and some non-locals on here. Lots of, this is great. Thanks for joining us today, guys. All right, I let's we do could, this. I wish we could see everybody. It would be no, so That's much the only better. thing. Yeah. I wish Zoom webinar had a little audience feature. Yeah. All right, everyone. Welcome to preview week for Willamette the Pinot Noir auction back for the second year in a row. The 2019 Willamette Valley wines featured in this tasting series are exclusive small lot bottlings for our wine trade auction. If you don't know about the auction and you'd like to learn about how to purchase these wines, you can contact Emily at the WVWA and I'll drop her address in the chat. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors for their ongoing support. And a big special thank you to our Imperial sponsor, Winebell. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists today, representing, so a uh, brief note, we are not going in the catalog order because this is the Chardonnay session. We're all about Chardonnay this morning. Uh, so we'll start off with Josh Bergstrom, representing Lot 67 of Bergstrom Wines. We've got Pat Dudley of Bethel Heights representing Lot 40. We've got David Adelsheim representing Adelsheim and Double Zero Wines Lot 27. Laurent Montelieu of Selena Estate and Domaine Divio representing Lot 47. Eugenia Keegan of Jackson Family Wines representing Grand Moraine and Sequitur Lot 58. David Millman of Domaine Drew in Oregon representing their collaboration with Irie Lot Number 13. And finally, Jessica Ensworth of Highland Estates and Stoller Family Estate Collaboration, Lot 79. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Ian Burch of Archery Summit. Take it away, Ian. Thank you, Julia. Very excited to be here. And thank you for turning in, tuning in virtually to Willamette, the Pinot Noir auction. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in person on August 5th, but we're excited to kind of get you excited and hopefully you're tasting along today. If you're on the East Coast or uh, maybe tasting at the right time, um, we're, we're starting a little bit early here in the Willamette. Um, as a winemaker in the Willamette Valley since 2008, I feel privileged to be moderating such an amazing group of pioneers, leaders, and innovators in this valley. Uh, for every, every bottle of uh, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, there is a very spectacular bottle of Willamette Valley Chardonnay. I'm very, very excited to uh, just kind of be in and among such a pioneering group of people. Um, everybody here has created a wonderful collaborative Willamette Valley Chardonnay, Chardonnay auction lot. And everyone presenting today is on the Willamette Valley Wine Auction Committee and has chaired this committee over the years. The proceeds from this event allow the Willamette Valley Wine Winery Association to educate our consumers about all the incredible things that the Willamette Valley is doing. And it also helps us to hire full-time staff and it helps our industry through great times and in challenging times. Uh, the list is endless. So thank you so much for supporting us. Um, these collaborative lots are extremely special and were introduced years ago by Laurent Montelieu to reward the service of the individuals that chair this Willamette Valley wine auction. And before we go any further, I would like to raise a glass by celebrating our recent accomplishment, largely led by Harry Peterson Edry. Um, the Willamette Valley just became the second American viticultural area, along with California's Napa Valley, to be granted protection from the uh, protected geographical indication status by the European Union. So we essentially are stamped as a Willamette Valley and our name is protected. 
So cheers to that. Thank you, Harry. Huge. Yes. But before we go any further, uh, I would like uh, Josh, if you could just kind of walk through a brief history of the Wine at Valley Wine Auction, because you've been so instrumental in um, you know helping, I guess the the voice of this valley for over the years. Well, thanks, and and to echo your points, Ian, I want to express how honored I am, uh, not only to participate in this auction, but to uh, to do it alongside such a really truly special group of people. Um, everyone on this in this group, for, for those of you who are on the call, should know that, uh, as Ian stated, everyone on this call is an auction committee member uh, and a current or past uh, chairperson of this auction, which they all help to create. Uh, so these are the people who make it all possible. And what, what really, um, to me, what's interesting is that they're also representing world-class family wine businesses, right? And it just, it blows my mind that even though these family businesses uh, represented here today uh, live or die based on their entrepreneurial efforts, uh, all of my friends here have somehow found the time to be true leaders uh, of our community and leaders of the national and international wine trade, having taken personal time over the years to write curriculum for textbooks or for the Oregon Pinot Camp. Uh, they've all mentored and taught uh, new generations of vineyard managers, winemakers, young wine sales forces, both locally, nationally, internationally. Uh, they all help to create world-class events like the International Pinot Noir Celebration. They've written language for grants and legislation and bylaws uh, for important moments in our valley where we had to protect agricultural land from overdevelopment or create new AVAs that did not exist or uphold the quality oriented and very important labeling laws uh, which make the Willamette Valley really unique to this world. And they've all served on pretty much every board of directors in the valley, uh, including the Willamette Valley Winders Association. And, and yes, um, they have all been and are auction committee members and chair people uh, since the inception of this great auction. And they've all done it on their own time and their own dime. And that's how the Willamette Valley Wineries community has advanced and thrived over the last 55 plus years. And my point here is that given the stress of running individual family businesses, this group of people here today, um, probably when it seemed like there was no more free time in the day, week, month, or year, uh, all came together seven years ago and turned a greatly needed idea into a long awaited reality. And they did it because they knew it was needed for the evolution of Oregon wines. And so, you know, this, this auction uh, was thought up and worked out by this group in each other's houses and tasting rooms and barrel cellars uh, over weeks and months and years. And thus, the Willamette Pinot Noir uh, auction for the trade is truly a microcosm of our community's work. Uh, it was created through mutual efforts uh, and passion to showcase our individuality, but also our collective quest um, for quality and qualitative advancement, which is what sets our Willamette Valley apart from any other wine region in the world. So today's tasting and discussion of these rare Chardonnay lots is really about the pioneering spirit. It really encapsulates what makes Willamette Valley special. And given the history of how these lots sell, I'm super excited uh, when August 5th rolls around to see these auction lots bidded on fast and furiously. So um, with that, I think I'm also the first to introduce a lot. So um, the Bergstrom lot, Julia, am I correct? Did you say we're lot 67? That sounds about right. Uh, um, yes. yes, Josh, 67. I want, to, I want to mention that the word collaborative has been thrown around, which is extremely important to this. And you'll notice that um, in this auction, some of the Chardonnay lots, including Bergstrom, um, were solo efforts. And of course, the pandemic, uh, social distancing rules, et cetera, was, was very difficult for some of us to get out and be able to share barrel tastings. Uh, and so this is the one year where some of the lots are not collaborative, but the collaborate spirit is very high. Um, our first collaborative lot we did in 2016, and David Adelsheim and I made a lot together that uh, was a Shehalem Mountains uh, ABA joint effort. 
In 2017, I collaborated with Brickhouse Vineyards and that was a Ribbon Ridge collaborative Chardonnay. And then in 2018, we collaborated with Evening Land Vineyard and did an Eola Amity Hills. Uh, this year, this is a single vineyard, a single barrel selection from the Bergstrom Vineyard, which is our family's original site in the Dundee Hills. Um, it's called White Gold. And the reason that is, is that name to me speaks a lot about the Bergstrom wine style and where I believe our regional expression of Chardonnay should be with this um, not yellow, but uh, vivid uh, um, kind of saline, non-oxidated, oxidative expression that's fruit forward, that's floral, that has minerality. And is this, I think that Willamette Valley Chardonnays because where we're located here above the, north, uh, the 45th parallel, um, they have to capture this great uh, kind of tightrope balancing act of balancing succulent fresh acidities with texture. Uh, we get great textural expression here, but I think that this great um, saline driven, mineral driven succulence of acidity is, is mother nature's gift to us up here and we need to harvest for that. So I like Chardonnays, including this one, that have a white gold, uh, very fresh tint to them, and even maybe a youthful green chlorophyll hue to them, which says that these wines are going to age, as we have seen as a community, quite well for a decade or more. So uh, those of you tasting along, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, five cases were produced, and it's lot 67. Wonderful. Thanks, Josh. It sounds delicious. So I'm going to introduce Pat Dudley with Bethel Heights. This is lot number 40. Uh, Pat, would you mind letting us know um, what your lot is all about and um, you know what, what the wine is like? Thanks, Ian. Um, and thank you, Josh, for that great opening statement. I think you spoke for all of us. I think I've been here longer than anybody except David Adelsheim on this panel. And I think I would like to just say more what Josh said about collaboration. It has brought us all the way. It's what always has worked for us in learning how to grow our grapes, how to make our wine, how to market our wine, and how to accomplish all these many events over the years. It's been about collaboration. And uh, we just wouldn't be where we are without it. And I'm, I'm sorry to say my lot is the second one that isn't a collaborative lot this year. Traditionally, we've had a collaborative Chardonnay since this program started with um, Walter Scott Winery. They're right next door to us and we share um, fruit from Justice Vineyard, including Chardonnay. So that's been our tradition all, the, all through these years, except 2019, it just didn't work uh, to collaborate. So we have a single lot and it's um, lot number 40, right? We said, right. This is what the bottle looks like in case some of you haven't seen it. It's a lot like the Pinot Noir bottle for the auction, except it's gold, like white gold. Um, we have uh, made this wine, it's called Justice Tempered with Mercy. And so it began with the Justice big block of Chardonnay that we always begin with. And 2019, that block was um, super opulent. I mean, it, it often is that. And it was the, you know, it, when you're looking for something that stands out from everything else, that's the kind of thing that you tend to hone in on is something that's very opulent, rich. And then as looking at it by itself, the justice lot, it was like just a little over the top. Um, we like balance. That's sort of the mantra of Bethel Heights winemaking. Speaking, by the way, for my nephew, Ben, we really believe in nepotism here at Bethel Heights. Ben Castile, my nephew, is the winemaker. I am not the winemaker. So what I'm saying are things that um, I chatted with Ben about it, and he just said it was a little bit out of balance. It was just crying out for something to bring it back from over the top. And so we have this wonderful old block planted in 1977, the oldest Chardonnay in our property. We used to sell it to David Adelsheim a little bit, way back in the day when he would look at me and say, we delivered the grapes. He said, you calling that ripe? <laughs> <That> is... <laughs> and now it would be overripe. 
And now it would be overripe. Exactly. This poor clone, we, the Wente clone, it's, it's uh, not widely planted up here. And it's not really a clone, it's a selection. But they're the oldest vines we have. And they're strange looking old creatures on a high wire trellis. They refuse to be retrained, <laughs> reprogrammed. They resisted the whole cultural revolution here. And so they uh, tend to be those vines that went to very late ripeners, as David said. Uh, it, it, for a long decades and decades, they didn't quite make it. And 2019 was another challenge. We've had all these hot vintages, but 2019 was cooler. And it almost didn't get ripe. And that's always the way we love it. And it has this beautiful acidity and also that um, I think that saline quality that comes from that, uh, that spot. So little dab of that with that beautiful opulent justice. And that's what you got, justice tempered with mercy. And we can't help being geeky about our Shakespeare quotations. It just pops out of everybody's heads around here because we were unfortunately not trained as winemakers, but as, you know, liberal arts professors. So we can't <laughs> have the title, but you know, cheers. We think you'll like this wine. Lot number 45 cases. Thank you, Pat. Again, this wine sounds incredible and everybody here makes such wonderful Chardonnay. This is uh, it's gonna be very exciting to try all these wines next week. So next up, we've got lot number 27, the Adelsheim and double zero Chardonnay lot. David, would you mind uh, giving us some details on this lot, please? No, I think I could do that. Uh, I've studied carefully uh, the information from Gina Hannon, our winemaker, and from Wynne Peters and Nedry, the winemaker for Double Zero. Um, and I'm just going to read all the pHs and sugars from all the lots <laughs> that... No, maybe I won't oh, do that. Goody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think the thing that... Well, first of all, Gina and Wynne are in the same tech group together. They've kind of grown up making wine together and particularly Chardonnay over the last, let's say 12 to 14 years. Uh, they, they never worked in the same place together, but through this collaboration at this women's tech group that meets monthly, they've sort of become partners in a lot of what they do and they, they kind of rely on talking to each other. So that's the name, that's the origin of the name Partners in Wine. They feel a special connection to each other. And so Gina and Wynne, uh, Gina had the, the requirement to come up with a collaborator on this and she very naturally chose Wynne to do it. And they basically decided that they would split it, each would contribute half, uh, obviously, if that had been a terrible wine, they would have come up with another option. But and and they had a number of lots to work with. But basically, they each brought to the table one of the best lots that they work with. For Gina, it was the lot from Ribbon Springs, which is a vineyard planted in uh, the late or the midnight. Well, the Chardonnay wasn't planted until eight years ago, it was really grafted on the Pinot Gris, but that's a different story. The Von Olsen Vineyard, which is uh, kind of up the road from Bethel Heights and Justice. Uh, it's kind of at the other end of Bethel Heights Road. It's basaltic soils, um, rather thin, and contributes a lot of roundness to this wine. The Ribbon Springs that Gina brought to the table is on the east side of Ribbon Ridge. It has the more saline quality growing basically at the ocean on sand, except that we're 100 miles from the ocean. Um, but the soil was formed under the ocean and it's, it, it's, it doesn't have the roundness, but it has the, uh, sort of the excitement and the acidity that Ribbon Ridge can contribute. And so it's actually a very interesting blend because bringing the roundness from uh, the Ola Hills and the more 
pointed, exciting flavors from uh, Ribbon Ridge creates quite an interesting blend. Um, the thing that attracts me so much about the numbers of this is the numbers on both these lots, the sugar, the sugar at picking for us was 19.1 to 19.6. And for Wynn, it was um, 20.9. Those are unheard ofly low numbers looking seven, eight years ago. We would have been picking at 22, 23, even higher, the wines would have been an entirely different animal. And, and I have to say that part of the reason I know that we are picking at those numbers, and I suspect perhaps when, is because of the technical tasting that the organization, not the organization, all the winemakers organize starting in around the same time as the auction, where we tasted each other's Chardonnay lots and at the beginning, they were like all over the board. I mean, every clone, every picking date, every amount of new wood, mal, lactic, full, none, everything you could think of. And now six, it's, I think it's seven years after that first tasting, everybody is stolen. Whoever's idea it was to pick <laughs> much earlier, it may have been Josh, it may have been Doug Tunnell, whoever it was, we've all we're all picking much, much earlier than we used to. And realizing as we did in these tastings that picking early doesn't mean you're picking unripe. You're picking and maintaining these low pHs, the high acidity, so that when you go through malolactic, you don't have flabby wine and you have this excitement that is really gonna be seen in virtually all the lots that are being described today. So I'm I'm going to drink to low sugars. <laughs> I'll drink 27. <laughs> well, thank you so much, David, and thanks for bringing up the technical tasting. I I do feel like this industry is extremely collaborative. Uh, I think everybody is very embracing of one another's techniques, and everybody's very eager to learn. And because of where we are, we have such an incredible area for Chardonnay, all this inherent acidity and crispness and beauty. So uh, it's, a, it's a very good thing for people to know that we, we communicate often as a group. And um, it's something I think that makes this industry special. And uh, without further ado here, we've got lot number 47, Selena Estate and Domaine Divio. And Laurent Multiu, I'm going to turn this over to you. And I have to say too, Laurent, I don't know if you remember this, but years ago, I was at Scott Hall, you took me into um, this wine auction. I remember you pitching this wine auction to me. And I don't think, uh, you know, without that conversation, I wouldn't have, you know, discovered this group and been part of such an incredible movement. So thanks for spreading the good word and, and uh, getting me, uh, reeling me in. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad to hear that I can be influential. That's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to reiterate a little bit what some of us have said and uh, as far as the, the, the first auction that we had, and I want to give my hats off to Josh for all the work. I think he sacrificed the whole year of his life to this auction, and it was just amazing work. So thank you again, Josh, for being the amazing leader that you were the first year. That was, that was the way to kick off the event. So thank you for that. By the way, I don't know if that gives you the right to pick on us now with posting pictures of Verizon in July, like yesterday, <laughs> scaring me to death. So, but anyway, that's a different subject. We'll get there. Uh, you know, to reiterate that uh, that collaborative spirits, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, part of the Oregon industry for 30 years, came out directly from uh, uh, France, out of the Bordeaux Institute of Enology as a young kid. And um, I felt immediately embraced by the whole industry. And seeing all the collaborative efforts that they were everywhere, the, pretty much when I got here, the International Pinot Noir Celebration was there. And I, that word celebration was very, very meaningful. And that's the way it's always been embraced. Uh, I got to meet all the Oregonians that were producing great Pinot Noirs, but also meeting a lot of Burgundian and New Zealander and Californian that were coming out to the celebration, where on the sidebar, we were also having very meaningful technical uh, seminars, one called Steamboat, where I think has been the most educa education uh, I have gathered um, 
regardless of uh, college. That was just amazing how a group of winemakers were getting together and in the spirit of collaboration, we're bringing their worst wines or their troubled wine and growing from that. And so that's the spirit of, of Steamboat, but I really em emphasize the spirit of the industry. We've had several groups that have been created. I've been fortunate enough to be part of a group that we call the Cellar Crawl, where we crawl through each other's cellars. It's eight of us. And we, uh, in a friendly way and in a very constructive way, are criticizing our wine and making sure that uh, you know, we are raising the quality. And I think that's why you've seen that incredible um, improvement of quality of the wines of Oregon, both on the Pinot Noir side, of course, but now on the Chardonnay. And I think, again, David didn't mention anything, but he, he gets a lot of credit for uh, David Adelsheim, that is. Melman, you get nothing, sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, David has been instrumental in bringing uh, to Oregon uh, the clones of uh, Charnay from, from Burgundy, all the new clones that we all work with. And so on top of the clones that Pat was mentioning, some of the heirloom clones that we've had since the seventies, we now have all the, the variety of the clones that were developed uh, by the French that are giving us a lot more complexity potentially, also minerality, et cetera. So it's been a, a really great accomplishment. So David, thank you for all the hard work that you put into this. I know that was, again, probably quite a few years out of your life as well. <laughs> so, but, um, uh, you know, on the, so to that point, I think that we now have Chardonnays in style that are made in Oregon that to me reflects some of the minerality that we typically correlate to uh, the old world style of wine, but also some of that ripeness, some of that roundness and some of that, that fruit component that we also associate with California or hotter climate. And I think Oregon both, you know, as far as geographically seems to fit in between those two styles because we get a little bit of both, but mostly we get that, that salinity that Josh was referring to. I, I call it minerality. Um, it's all the kind of the same component of nervousness that we get in the wine that is really, really wonderful. Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's the key to um, the new waves of Chardonnay. And I think we're part of that where some of you, unfortunately, are still discovering us, but uh, hopefully with uh, events like this, where we're able to add the Chardonnay to our Pinot Noir lineup, you're able to kind of recognize that Oregon can be, uh, can be amazing with the production of Chardonnay as well. We all knew this for a long time, but I think now you, you, the rest of you are kind of discovering that. So uh, cheers to that. Uh, so the lot that I'm gonna be presenting, I was very fortunate that Bruno and I actually were confining in the same, um, uh, same company and the same winery. So we are able to make a collaborative lot uh, out of 2020. Um, in 2020 was the, uh, with the COVID, respecting all the social distancing, not tasting out of the same glass and all that, but uh, we're still able to make that. So this is a, a combination of uh, Solena, which is my home estate, uh, which is on Wollakenzi Terroir, and then Domaine Divio from Bruno that is on Ribbon Ridge. Uh, so we've been, um, again, collaborating, collaborating uh, for a long time. I met uh, Bruno at David Millman's winery at uh, Domaine Drouin, Oregon, back in the early 90s. Um, as he was an uh, intern with Veronique and he then escaped to uh, Tahiti and then escaped to uh, Washington but I finally took me about eight years to get him back here but he's been working with me as our director of winemaking and viticulture and so it's been uh, just a pleasure to share this lot uh, not only are we co-workers but uh, we've been great friends for a long long time so it's uh, it's very special for us to work on that uh, both of us like to work on the mouse feel so even though we have that nice nervousness uh, we do a lot of lease steering to the wine. That's a component that we like to do. So we'll steer the lees of the wines and the Chardonnay for about close to three months post um, active fermentation is, is done. So that's uh, a little bit to the wine. I hope that you enjoy it. And it is lot 47. Enjoy. Thank you, Laurent. So we have Eugenia lot number 58. We've got Grand Marine and Sequitur. And uh, Eugenia, I think your Chardonnay is the first I've ever bought a case of because winemakers don't make a lot of money. And I remember going into your tasting room and I was like, Eugenia, like, I think you were kind of new to Oregon, new to me at least. And I love your style. And I think you are actually one of the most hilarious um, individuals I've ever met in my life. And um, 
uh, it's a privilege to be up here with all of you guys today, and I'd love to hear about your wine. Ian, thank you so much. Um, we had a little dress rehearsal for this last week. Yes, believe it or not, we still do dress rehearsals, assuming everybody shows up, of course. And um, no references there to the team made here, um, no call outs. But what it did do in the rehearsal was it reminded us, and it was Pat specifically that was reminding us of all of the interesting um, specialties of each year, each one of us having been the chair. And in year number four, I was co-chair with Shirley Brooks. And we, it was, you know, the fourth year we were on, we were on a roll. We had Josh and then Pat and David Adelsheim were the uh, chairs. And then we had Laurent and the, the, the bugs had all been worked out of the program and we were growing and moving and it was very exciting. And, it, you know, collaboration is actually contagious. We talk a lot about contagious things these days, and I'm gonna talk about something that's wonderfully contagious and fun, and that's collaboration. So Shirley and I had a really big goal. We really wanted to hit a million dollars that year. It just seemed appropriate. And so we were just focused, focused, focused on this. And so we were up on the dais while we're doing the auction, and we literally are, Shirley, just sitting next to me, writing down every lot, how much, keeping a rolling tab, and we're getting to the last slot and we have 900, I believe it was $944,000 and we have one lot left. There's no lot, even the most, the most expensive lot wasn't gonna take us over the finish line. And I could feel surely, and, and then me at Contagious, we just deflated, just deflated. We were like, not gonna happen. We were almost, in, I was almost in tears. I was like, this isn't gonna happen. And I, while we were being deflated up there, some activity got going in the crowd and uh, Fritz must have seen what was going on because it was a buzz, buzz, buzz out in the crowd. And the next thing you knew, we auctioned off the final lot of the afternoon and six, six of our bidders got together and collaboratively bought the lot for $60,000 and threw us over the million dollar mark. Well, tears, bubbles, fanfare. It was an amazing moment. I still remember it. I get chills. It was so exciting. So collaboration is contagious and we look forward to uh, infecting you uh, when you get out here next week. Uh, and for those that we infect virtually, we'll plan on doing that too. But lot number 58, correct? Ian, 58? Thank you. Uh, this is a collaboration between Grammarain and Sequitur. Sequitur is owned by uh, Mike Etzel, and he and his son Mikey uh, make this wine together. And the winemaker Grammarain is my colleague Shane Moore. And Shane is a huge, huge skier, uh, uh, whatever those dangerous boards are, snowboards, and so are the Etzel family. And these guys take off routinely on Fridays and go off skiing. And I know Shane puts in some excuse. I don't know, he's babysitting or he's doing something, but I know the boys are up on the slopes and they have a really good time together. And I think one of Shane's most enjoyable projects every year since he's been allowed to do this is to choose his collaborative partner. And it's been Jason Lett from Irie, and he's had a really lovely time. And this year, he reached out to Mike Etzel, and he and uh, Shane put together the Amphora project. So they had agreed to do this in advance, and um, they each have Amphora. I don't think theirs are as lovely as ours because ours are all painted and decorated. Um, you know, cellar guys get bored sometimes, and that's the way they take out their excess creative energy is painting uh, painting Amphoras. Uh, but uh, so at, at Graham Rain, this is about 20% M4 and it's about 20% over at uh, Sequitur. It's not 100% M4 done. Um, one of the things that you've heard over and over, of course, is salinity, minerality, all of these incredible, the, all the stuff that adds to the backbone and the infrastructure that just makes these wines nervous and delicious. And, you know, the, the, you finish one sip and you have to have another. To me, that is one of the great definitions of wine and food that you, you once you have one, you just have to have another. You're not satiated, you're not tired. It's just that enhancing uh, every, every sip in our case. And both uh, Sequitur and, in, in Ribbon Ridge and Grand Moraine in Yamhill Carlton are on sedimentary soils. And they, they bring a nice mid 
tannic palate. Shane calls it gravel through the middle of the mouth. I'm not sure that that's prime time uh, vocabulary, but it really does talk about that long length that you get in the, in the mid palate as it takes you all the way to the back. And then we've used a term, we call it white clover. You've heard white gold, there's, um, but there is this little bit of a flower in the spring, but a little bit of the green that you get in, in herbs, not in herbaceousness, it's quite different than that. It's a freshness and a liveliness. And our little term is white clover, and I think everybody's created their own. And, and then fruits, of course, you start just to get into the stone fruits, just a little bit. Um, but again, everything is very restrained. Uh, Shane is the master of early picking. In fact, if you were to ask him, he'd say, I don't pick early, everybody else picks late. And at some point I've decided that maybe he's just right about that. Um, so rich, rich, delicious. Um, it's been great to have all the toasts this morning because it's allowed us to have all those extra sips uh, as the wines have opened up. But uh, wait till you taste uh, lot number 58. We look forward to seeing you at the table next Thursday, week from Thursday. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eugenia. Again, sounds delicious. And I'm noticing a theme here with collaboration. It's great to hear all these stories. I don't think people realize how much this, this industry gets together and how much collaboration there is. So next up, we've got lot number 13. So this is a collaboration between uh, Domain Dren and Irie Vineyards. And we've got David Millman up to bat here. Um, take it away, David. Good morning. Uh, very hard acts to follow. Um, and in fact, the 2019 auction was a very hard act to follow. I was chair last year of the 2020 auction. And I think uh, as I look back and, and I think about the challenges of, of uh, you know, reorganizing, restaging something in the midst of a very uncertain environment, the thing that makes me proudest is not only did the community rally together to put the auction on and uh, our supporters came and bought lots, but that the Blount Valley Wineries Association would still donate 25% uh, of the proceeds to the James Beard Foundation. Um, I thought just spoke volumes about who uh, the Willamette Valley is, if you can personify it in that way. Um, so yeah, that really just, uh, uh, th that's a, a super important moment. And when I think about this collaboration that we have with Irie, it's just, it's so personal. This is a family story. Um, you know, the Letts have always meant the world to the Durans and the Durans have meant the world to the Letts. And so when this opportunity came up first in the 2018 vintage to work together, it, it really just became a great excuse in a busy world for, for Veronique and uh, Jason Lett and Aaron Bell, our assistant winemaker, just to spend time together talking about uh, the Chardonnays they're working on and how they might put together something um, that would be delicious and special for the auction. Um, so thank you all for uh, letting us have this excuse um, uh, to work together. Um, you know, one of the talismans that I keep in my office is this bottle. It's a, a bottle of 1970 Irie Chardonnay, um, empty, but I was there to enjoy this at a tasting many years ago. And I love the fact that it's, it's a hand numbered bottle. Diana Lett talks about having you know, sat in her living room numbering these by hand while watching television uh, in the early 70s. And if you think about the lots today, they are not too far away from that. We're talking about you know, five cases plus another case for samples or something like that. But it's basically that personal, that focused. Um, it, you know, the word handcrafted is so overused in the world, but this actually is. And so I love that. I love that. As for the wine uh, itself, um, well, that's this, unlabeled so far. Veronique will be back shortly so she can write her name on the labels and then we can label the wine up for the lucky winner. Uh, it's an, it, it is a, a collaboration, it's a blend of, of the two uh, pieces. Um, Jason's vines have an average age of about 48 years. Uh, ours are in the 20 to 25 year range. Um, they're all Dundee Hills from our state here. And then I could just about walk you out into the vineyard and point to his uh, plot down the hill. And um, his went through all through Mallow. Ours is a combination of tank fermented 
and barrel fermented, like what we do with our tour, we like the balance that that gives. And then in combination with, with his piece, which has just such a, uh, you know, Eugenia talks about length. I, I don't know if I can out long <laughs> Eugenia on that, but it's, 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 there's that beauty in, in the finish. Um, and you know, it's something special and something that's very different than what either of us uh, produce on our own. And I think uh, as a collaboration should be, it should be unique and this auction deserves it. And the, the person lucky enough to, um, uh, to you know, get the lot, um, lot number 13, uh, we'll be able to enjoy that. Um, that's really sort of what I wanna say. It's a, really, it's a thank you and an honor to be able to help put this together um, because it's personal, because it's a story of friendship. I, I think about Veronique coming here in 1986 and, and spending time with, of course, you know, Dave Adelsheim, uh, with the Castiles, with, and of course the Letts. Um, you have that key history uh, the reason why the Durands came, they'll, they'll tell you flat out, it's yes, there was the chance to make wonderful wine, but without the community, it would have been pointless. Um, they needed that. That was the, 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 that's the thing that made it, you know, seem possible, uh, despite all the logistical challenges. And of course, the next year, when I believe when the uh, Durands were buying the property here, uh, almost Oh gosh, it was 1987, almost to the day that they bought the land where I am right now. Uh, Jason was in Burgundy working in the Duran cellar. So there's just been a lot of love over the years. And I hope that is reflected in what we offer for lot 13. Thank you, David. I'm excited to try your wine. And thanks for that beautiful backstory. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we've got lot number 79. So we have Highland Estates and Stoller Family Estate. And we're having Jessica Ensworth, our fearless leader this year for the auction. Um, I'd love to hear about your lot and your story, Jessica. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, it, it, it's been, it, it's amazing to sit on, uh, to be a chair of this incredible auction, given the, the people that have served before. Um, you know, I, I kind of have a tendency to raise my hand for a lot of things. And it's not because I, I want to spend more time <laughs> doing as many things as possible, but I get the privilege of serving with my mentors and the creators of this industry who have been, talk about fearless, have been absolutely instrumental in, in being fresh and, and flexible, reinvigorating and reinventing this era, this region, being incredibly progressive. And um, it's an honor to be amongst this group of people. And I can say everybody on this panel has personally taken time with me in my tenure in Oregon to be a mentor in some way. And um, I'm incredibly honored and privileged that I get to be amongst you and thank you for that. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the things about Oregon. It's like, yeah, we, we, we do a lot of collaboration, but there's also an incredible amount of just personal time that people take for with, with anybody who asks um, to help them grow in their profession and in their understanding of this region. And I think it's, um, my, you know, our job to pay it forward and it just seems to keep going. So it's a real privilege. And I, I also want to acknowledge our last year's chair, David Millman, who, you know, we had a formula for a lot of years that worked. I mean, there was like an engine that was running and we knew how to do that. And, and then we got this incredible curveball. and David Millman was at the helm solo, no co-chair and was just captained that amazingly difficult ship and brought it home. And David, I just have to say, like, you just did such a wonderful job. And, and then to come into this year in 2020, or the, I'm sorry, 2021, um, with this vintage and um, my co-chair, Rob Alstron, I'm so thankful to have him from Adelsheim as well. Um, we just felt like, you know, we're, we're having to reinvent a little bit. And uh, we're just so glad to have you guys along with us and that we could, we could pull this off and we can put it together. And um, this auction coming up is the first event that we've gotten to throw really in the last couple of years. We skipped two years of IPNC, two years of Pinot Camp, and we did a virtual auction. And so our lives have been put on hold. So I think it's incredibly special that we get to get together again and uh, be here in person and give each other a hug and <laughs> share some wine and talk in person. Um, so we're incredibly helpful and are hopeful that this is going to be an amazing event and we know how to throw a party out here. So we're excited to see you and we thank you. 
Um, on to the lot, my our lot, which is a incredible collaboration between Highland Estates and Stoller Vineyard. So um, Ann Siri and Kate Payne Brown came together to make this 10 case lot. It's called the Volcanic Duet, number, uh, lot number 79. Um, and it's it's got great origins because um, the Stoller lot uh, was planted in 1995 and that's in volcanic soils and the Highland Estates lot was planted in 1979, um, high wire trained also in volcanic soil. So we have these two regions, Highland Estates being in McMinnville, Stoller being in Dundee, volcanic soils from two very, very different regions that have incredibly different uh, typicity of place. And so bringing those things together, we were able to put a 10 case lot um, from these two incredible estates, these important, by these two important wine women um, who, brought, who brought it together. So this lot um, brings these old vines from Stoller and the old vines from Highland. Uh, the Stoller was uh, picked on the 14th of September, the Highland on the 29th of September um, in 2019. Uh, they both went through um, extended elevage. So we had um, the Stoller lot 12 months in oak, 20% uh, new French oak, and then six months in stainless. And Highland Estates did 18 months in 25% new French oak. A uh, little bit of uh, st leaves stirring in the beginning parts during fermentation primary. Um, and then coming out with this incredible rich and lush Chardonnay that I think we've, we're hearing a thread that's coming through the Oregon Chardonnay story about the stylistic that uh, of, of our styles. This lot particularly has a lot of stone fruit, a lot of apricot and white peach um, and white nectarine. It has a really distinctive Bosch pear, uh, ginger spice, and it's got, you know, just some characteristic spiciness to it, but it has a richness and a creaminess in the mid palate. And then it has a very lengthy finish um, that kind of finishes on a, a key lime pie note with some honeysuckle and white flowers. Um, it's a really pretty floral and fruit forward um, lot, but has a real tension underneath it. I'd say the acid is about medium, the body's medium. Uh, alcohol, I think is about medium minus, medium, medium minus. Um, but the, uh, the finish I think is medium plus. Um, has a really pretty, uh, middle palette of, of pear and ginger and a little bit of uh, cream, lemon meringue cream, key lime pie. So I think that this is, we're, we're so excited to present these and I think they are incredibly food friendly and uh, they're really elegant and sexy. And so can't wait for you to try them. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, there's a, a lot of fantastic Chardonnays to, to try when when you guys come into town, hopefully you've gotten some samples and you're able to join us today. And, you know, having a group like this is rare and having all these incredible individuals, these pioneering people um, in the same room is, is awesome. And I'm just curious, I want to throw this out there. Uh, how do you guys think the perception of Oregon Chardonnay has changed over the years? from where we began as an industry to who we are now. I'm really curious because most of you either got stock and put it in the ground or picked a style and liked it or maybe didn't like it and changed. And I'm just curious to see how you've seen Oregon Chardonnay, or well, I'm at Valley Chardonnay, excuse me, uh, progress over the years. Well, I could chime in real quick that I, it always astounds me that you know, um, Oregon produces 1% of the wine in the United States, only 1%. And Chardonnay is around 5% of what we produce in the state. So we just had a 45 minute Zoom about 0.05% of America's wine, uh, you know, which says a lot because uh, that's how far Willamette Valley Chardonnay and Oregon Chardonnay have come from, you know, just one of the many whites we make to complement our Pinot Noir to becoming a major discussion topic that is in major articles, major publications um, that professional sommeliers and wine buyers are going out of their way to find because of course they're produced in scarce, scarce amounts. Um, but I, I think that statistic right there always blows my mind when I think about it. Hey, Ian, there's, there's something I would add to what Josh said. I mean, Chardonnay has always been part of the mix. I mean, in the beginning, we were planting Pinot Noir, of course, but we were planting Riesling and Chardonnay. And what happened to Chardonnay, um, I'll come to, but in the beginning, 
I mean, we were getting gold medals at the State Fair and at the Seattle Enological Society. Uh, Bill Fuller at Tualatin had the first top 100 in the Wine Spectator for a Chardonnay back in the mid 80s. I mean, this is, the, Chardonnay has always been part of what we do, but it's always been so secondary to Pinot Noir. And in some sense, uh, for a long time, it was secondary to Pinot Gris, which is what 13 or 14 percent, where Chardonnay is seven percent of what we grow in the Willamette Valley today. But the Chardonnay percentage is just ramping up so quickly at this point. I think, I mean, I remember the style of Chardonnay that we made in '79 that won these gold medals, and it sucked. I mean, it was. <laughs> It was so bad. It was so ripe and so out of balance. I mean, not everything we made at the beginning was that bad, if you will, but we were learning how to make wine in the beginning. And it took us a while to figure it out, partly because most of us had no background. I mean, I had literally no background. And I mean, people like Fuller had made wine in California for 10 years, but most of us were kind of trying to figure it out. By, by 2000, we pretty much proved to the world that we knew what we were doing with Pinot Noir and our attention turned to other things like what does place mean? But also I think frankly that allowed us to revisit what Chardonnay could be, partly because of the clones that came in from France, but partly because we knew what we were doing with Pinot and, and the creativity that virtually every winemaker has was put to use in trying to figure out what this thing Chardonnay means for the Willamette Valley. David, I'm glad that you used those harsh words on the wines from the 80s. So now I can do it as well a little bit. Uh, but yeah, we made wines that were very, very crisp and lean and mean. Um, they were in stainless steel and we're like, hey, Chablis does it. So why don't you guys like it as well? And that's just didn't work very well, but I, I could only agree so much with what you said as far as the emphasis and the, the, the attention to detail, both first in the vineyard on the clone selection, the growing of the grapes, the exposure of the fruit, uh, the crop levels, all those items were fine tuned uh, over the you know, 90s into the 2000 with Chardonnay. And then exactly what you said as well, as far as the emphasis on making wines with a purpose with Chardonnay and making sure that uh, all the winemaking was following, of course, barrel fermentation, steering, or all the all the things that went around the, the fermentation process were much more elaborate and were much more determined and sought through with a, uh, with a real plan of action and with a really, again, a collaborative spirit where everybody was learning, as you were describing the, the group that got together uh, from each other. And as, you know, as we all remember, it's, it was a, a rocket to the top. And I think that now we compete with the very best Chardonnay in the world in our own style, which is really magnificent. You might also say that the, the timing was convenient, that the anything but Chardonnay uh, movement <laughs> finally died out, um, just as Oregon Chardonnay was really starting to hit its stride. Yeah, good point. Ian, may I jump in for a moment? Oh, because we had a, a really insightful question, I thought, in the chat just now, and this is a consumer dipping their toes into Willamette Valley Chardonnay. Um, for those consumers who are learning about the style, learning to understand how it might differ from, say, Russian River, Hawks Bay, uh, what are some voc vocabulary terms you tend to find yourself using? What are some ways to understand the specific Willamette Valley style um, for, fo for folks who maybe avoided Chardonnay in the past or are just kind of coming to this as a, as a new take on it? The, if you look at California Chardonnays, and I think early on Oregon made some attempt to mimic a style like that because it was a very popular style starting in the early 80s, the California New World style. But everything they do is literally at this point counter, <laughs> counterpoint to what we do here in Oregon. Um, working for an extended California company, um, it's still very common to be picking Chardonnay in California at 23, 24 bricks. The guys at 22 are the, are the mavericks. 
um, picking so early like that. So there's a, an incredible ripeness that comes out in all of those uh, terms like tropical and things that we use that you don't really hear used with uh, with describing uh, fruit in, in Oregon uh, Chardonnays, Willamette Valley Chardonnays. But you also, the result of that is the alcohol. So you've, I, I, if, if there's a California Chardonnay under 14% alcohol, I'd love to see it. Um, so you've got uh, tropical fruit flavors, you've got high alcohol, they tend to use oak as a big part of the equation. There are stainless steel versions, of course, but they tend to use oak, a lot of it, um, often more new. Uh, certainly, we're at about the 10 to 15% new at, uh, at Grand Moraine, and I think other people have numbers that are similar to that. Californians are still up at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and even 100% new oak. Um, they tend to bottle earlier. We are all pretty much in the more classic 16 to 20 month uh, category. There are still many of them, if not most, are bottled in that uh, June, July, August, um, right after the, the vintage that they came from. So uh, there's still a number of technique differences right off the bat. So, and, and I think that, 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 uh, um, Laurent used the, the rocket ship that we did in, 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 our, in our wine quality. And I think it was a combination of, yes, collaboration. Once again, our, our Chardonnay tech uh, day that we really learned together and you're allowed to taste 85 wines from your neighbors uh, with all the data you could ever hope to have. And it really helps intellectually get your head and then, and then, and then organoleptically get you focused on what's going on in other people's cellars. You add that to what I would say a level of confidence. Um, when Oregon winemakers started making wine, certainly 50 years ago, there was no confidence, but even 30 and 20. But now there's, an, there's such good wines in the Pinot Noir category that you can take that sense of accomplishment and quality and focus and move it over to another variety as we did with, with Chardonnay. So it's a, a like every um, uh, you know, great storm, it was a combination of events, but very quickly in the last 10 years, I think we've gone from still figuring it out to knowing exactly where we are and where we're going. And uh, these wines here are brilliant, but if you took time to drive around the hood, you would taste another 25, 35, 40 brilliant Chardonnays, not just the ones we're offering today. I would just add briefly that, you know, we are trying to make Willamette Valley Chardonnay in the Willamette. So we're not trying to emulate Burgundy or we're not trying to emulate California. And I'm not sure if necessarily Picking earlier in California would be the right idea anyway. So I, I personally enjoy some of those big opulent ripe Chardonnays, uh, but that's a style that is not really attainable here in Oregon and in the Willamette Valley. So we are really, similar to what we always said about Pinot Noir, we're making Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley, um, not trying to emulate Burgundy in the Willamette Valley. The same thing applies to Chardonnay. I just want to throw one more thing in this that we haven't mentioned, but it's it's sort of the elephant in the room, which is climate. I mean, the luxury of being able to say, I'm going to pick early at 21. We were lucky to get to 21 at the very end of the season back in the early 80s. So really, that that's something we tend to forget how the luxury of being able to choose your picking date on Chardonnay instead of waiting until the final rain cloud piled over the hills and then pick because you had to. So. I remember those days and I'll tell you what, it's a lot nicer to have your choice when to pick than being forced to pick and hooray for the climate for this little moment we have it on our side. Very little moment, but it's, it helps. And I just wanna mention the, the uh, we do an event every year we have in the past and hopefully that'll resume shortly is the Oregon and Chardonnay celebration. And that's a, a, a wonderful seminar that brings the community together to taste and to talk about education and kind of all of us is a summit that that um, um, all of us have participated in in different ways that is a really intelligent and, and interesting look at Chardonnay. We're giving it its credit in a different way and um, and coming together to talk about it. So that might be something to, to when we resume that again, the Oregon Chardonnay celebration would be something that we hope to grow and make that a much larger part of the media and the trade um, because we think it's such an important part of the fabric of Willamette Valley wines and, um, and they need their due, so. It's a public event. People can buy tickets 
historically it's been in what March? February, February typically. Late, yeah. late February typically. But it's so usually it's in a really small venue. So it's been very, very limited, very exclusive. I think 250 people is the max that have attended at one time. But we I think that that's got some great potential to grow that as a even larger. And I think there's a lot of interest as well. Uh, I want to add uh, to that point, Jessica, that it ends with a grand tasting. So there are, help me with the number, but 60 or 70 Chardonnays to taste. So if you are interested in learning about Willamette Valley Chardonnay, that is a great event to get uh, an impressive overview very quickly. Ian, I think you're muted. All right. Well, I I don't see any more questions coming through chat. Um, I, have I, a, I have both a nerdy one and a oh, non-nerdy awesome. one. Would you like a, do you have a preference? <laughs> I'm a nerd by heart. Like I'm a geeky winemaker, so. Do you I guys like mind if out. I ask a nerdy question? Do, do you feel, David spoke of the, and, and a couple of you have spoken of, of just um, changes in, in when, when you were able to pick bricks wise. I have, understood here and there that in various cool climates, cooler climates, it is easier to have um, an agreement between sugar ripeness and physiological. Do you feel like that is more true than it used to be in the Limit Valley when you like, in terms of picking decisions, do you feel like it's all kind of coming together at the same time more? I actually, um, I don't know if this is how everyone else feels, but I actually don't care about sugars at all with Chardonnay. Uh, I pay much more attention to acidity and flavors. And I, I think we have been fortunate since probably, I don't know, the last six, seven, eight years that sugars have been in line when acidities are ready. Um, but um, I think that, you know, it's very different than Pinot Noir. I, th I think if we picked Pinot Noir the, the way we picked Chardonnay, we wouldn't be famous for Pinot Noir. And I, I think that Chardonnay does need a different attention to detail, which is more in tune with natural acidities than it is with sugars. I totally agree, Josh. In fact, I think what we found is when we were looking for flavor walking through our Chardonnay vineyards and we found it and we'd pick it, we picked too late. And we had to throw away those refractometers and start looking at the pH and acid to and, and when we did that properly, it turned out that our, shard, that our sugars were in that 19 to 20, 21 maybe category, but we started picking with a very different criteria in mind. Yeah, I think that um, uh, my aha moment was in Burgundy on the sorting line, uh, you know, and tasting uh, Batard Morache as it was passing by me. And it was, a, it was a sunny day. The forecast was for 10 days of sun and they had picked it and it was, the fruit was green, and I was tasting it thinking, God, these guys really screwed up. Um, and of course they did not, because um, you know, to capture a region style, you have to know what your strong point is. And similar to Burgundy, yet quite different, our strong suit is, is acidity. And it doesn't matter if the sun is gonna be shining for 10 more days. When Chardonnay is ready, it has to be picked. And unlike Pinot Noir, I think that window of style and that window of forgiveness is so much smaller. And if you miss Chardonnay by a day, you've missed a style. Fantastic. Yeah. Julia, was that your nerdy question or your not nerdy was, question? I'm curious what the was, not nerdy question is. It was the less nerdy, uh, or I'm sorry, the more nerdy question. My less nerdy <laughs> question was actually, I was um, just all this talk of our, our history is so inspiring. And I was curious from each of you, your favorite piece of advice you've ever gotten from another person in the Willamette Valley wine industry. Good one. Which may end up being the more nerdy question. Mine was probably you should have stuck with beer. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was probably something like trust, trust your, trust your intellect and your palate. Don't, you know, don't follow trendsetters. Do what you think is right. Mine was probably from Gary Andrus, who 
told me, don't let your winemaker make all the decisions. Good advice. You, you can, you can, you winemakers out there, <laughs> you can take that as you wish. We know everything. That sounds like him. I think he told me that too. <laughs> well, it's paid off well for both of you. I, I, I hope he told many people that clearly if they turn out to be as successful as you two. I think, I think mine came from Robert Duran, just, just every year, this mantra of don't be self-satisfied. It's just, you know, did you do the best you could do? Did, did you make every decisions that, you know, the best decisions you could make and just, just, you know, keep at it. I wasn't going to say anything because I'm not the winemaker, but I do run the family business and have for a long time. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from Jessica Emsworth. And you may remember that day sitting outside and she's and we were talking about trying to hire a marketing director. We have never succeeded with that. And she said to me, hire from within always. And so it was this moment of aha. Look at the people that you have in your family, on your team, and bring along, find out what they're good at, find out what they love, find out what they can do, and then bring them along. It's been, I mean, I've done that ever since, and it has been amazingly successful um, in terms of just cohesiveness behind the scenes. And it's not about the winemaking, but it is about the team that Bethel Heights is. And thank you, Jessica, it still works. What a, that's really cool. <laughs> that's shock. Um, I think, I think uh, in, in reciprocation, I think both uh, Pat Dudley and Eugenie Keegan have taken time to mentor me. Um, when I first moved, I was working for Maysara Winery and I was asking Mo Momtazi about how, how to, <laughs> how to do it. And he goes, you need to call Pat Dudley. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> but I think, um, uh, both of those women uh, always told me that this is a relationship business and that you have to build the best relationships and, and keep them and, uh, and make sure that that becomes a priority over anything else. Um, and keep the relationships and keep them strong and keep them going. And it served me really well. So I thank you back. <laughs> That's very kind. Well, gang, this has been an incredible amount of fun. And it's, again, a very large pleasure for me to uh, talk with all of you and see what you guys are doing. And I am very excited to taste these wines. And you guys are some of the most incredible Chardonnay producers I know. So thanks again for tuning in. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yes, thank you, Ian. Thank you, panelists. For those of you who are joining us virtually or in person next week, we will see you August 5th. And um, I dropped the link to the rest of the preview schedule in the chat. Please join us. We are doing all sorts of fun virtual tastings all week long. So thank you, panelists. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, attendees. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you guests. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs>